What's up, everybody? And thank you for tuning in to the first episode of The Real State of Retail, where myself and my colleague, my, my, my close, close buddy, Russell Helbling, will be talking about the state of the retail real estate industry uh, and then diving into a bunch of different categories that we like to focus on. Um, which happen to be, in a lot of ways, things that are less impacted by the Internet. So a lot of the discussions we're going to have uh, will definitely relate to how the Internet has affected our business, retail in general, restaurants, service-oriented uh, businesses, a lot of things like that. Uh, the inspiration for this podcast came from a conversation that I had with Gary Vaynerchuk, and uh, he basically pointed out to me that nobody was really doing something uh, in the podcast arena very specific to what we do. Uh, and I thought, who better than myself to get involved in this? So shouts to Gary. Super excited that our first guest on this podcast is Josh Weinkranz, close friend of mine. Uh, we've been friends in the industry for about 20 years now. Uh, he is the president of the Northern Region at Kimco Realty Corporation, one of the largest uh, shopping center owners in the country. And uh, in this episode of the podcast, not only will you understand Josh's perspective on retail, real estate, uh, and a lot of other things, you'll hear about actually how we met 20 years ago. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Tune in. This is the first episode. Get ready for the ride. Welcome to the Real State of Retail podcast. We are your hosts, Jason Ciano and Russell Helbling. We are retail and real estate experts that focus on emerging concepts in the food, fitness, and wellness sector with a flair for social media and digital marketing. In this podcast, we'll be discussing the post-internet impact on the retail and real estate industries. Each episode will feature inspirational guests and thought leaders in their respective fields, giving their input on how they believe retail and real estate will look tomorrow. Now let's get it popping. Welcome to the Real State of Retail podcast with myself, Jason Ciano. And Russell Helbling. And our guest for today is the one, the only, Josh Weinkrantz. Hey, thanks for having me. Welcome. Thanks well, for being here. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, so this is our first episode with a guest. I guess it's actually our first official episode with this new title, right? Uh, it is. We were <laughs> chopping it up episode zero. That's right. So now this is the Real Estate of Retail Episode one, so yes. it's a little different. We, we, we took a little of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's advice and uh, decided to get a lot more specific about the content of the podcast, um, which is going to be more about commercial real estate, retail, which the three of us primarily focus on, I would say. Um, hence the name, The Real Estate of Retail. See, there's method to the madness. Apparently. <laughs> so, Josh, without further ado, yes. let's dive on into some questions. Yeah. Let's get uh, right into it. Let's go. I mean, the, so the way that we set this up, the format here is that we're, we gave uh, Josh a bunch of questions and we are... Uh, going to dive into industry-specific questions, and we'll talk about them for as long as we feel like talking about them. So at the end of the day, if we end up getting to 11 questions or only three questions, but we've had an amazing conversation, it's going to be all worth it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So why don't you read the first question, Russell? Well, didn't we decide we were going to do uh, the five headlines, right? Do you want to do that? Yeah, but we, we didn't have them in advance. We were supposed to kind of read them ourselves, I would think. Uh, so headlines of what? Of, of who of you are and what you, you do. Are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so we, we could do that. But you know what? Before we do that, why don't we actually have Josh introduce himself? Perfect. So, so who are you and what do you do? Who am I? Well, I'm Josh Weinkrantz. I work for Kimco Realty. I am the president of the Northern Region um, which is a new position as of the first of this year. The northern region is a combination of uh, what used to be our northeast region and our central region. We combined it together to create uh, one less region and um, try to create some efficiency throughout the company. So the region really stretches from the northeast all the way out to the um, 
the Midwest and, uh, you know, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri. Um, we have 137 properties in that region. It's just shy of 20 million square feet, uh, about 1,700 tenants, and uh, an annual NOI of about $265 million. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a big portfolio, a big chunk of the company. Um, and gives us a pretty good read on, you know, kind of what's going on in the overall market. So it's exciting stuff. It's great. That's excellent. Big territory and definitely, uh, obviously, you have your finger on the pulse of the industry as a result of that. So we see uh, a lot. Yes. (laughs) And and I think that'll, uh, you know, your perspective on things will be very interesting. I and thought it was interesting when you mentioned Missouri, your eyebrows kind of went up and I'm wondering, is, has it been an interesting market for you? It has because many of these markets I haven't been to before. Um, and although we've owned property in many of these markets for a long time, um, I never was really exposed to it. I'd never been to Missouri. You know, I've never been really to Michigan. Um, you know, we have property in Kentucky. I never went to Kentucky. So it's been interesting this year, really, I've been spending a lot of time traveling, going out to a lot of these properties, learning some of the markets, learning about new tenants that we don't have in the Northeast or in New York or Long Island. Um, and so, you know, you, f- you find some interesting things, you know, there are tenants that you just didn't know about that exist. But the one thing that you realize more so than anything else is that the business is still the same whether you're on Long Island, whether you're in New York, upstate in Connecticut or Vermont um, or Kentucky or Missouri, the shopping centers are the same. You know, they're primarily grocery anchored. You have your, you know, your, your pet store, your hair salon, your nail salon, the same type of issues that we deal with here, we're dealing with out there. there are some different challenges because the markets are different and the economies are different. They have different issues that they're dealing with. Sure. Less density in most cases, Defin- I, w- I would assume. Definitely less density, um, you know, more sprawl than we're used to, certainly than uh, in New York Metro, um, which creates its own issues. But in general, it's the same business. And so when you know how to do it here, you know how to do it there. And it's just learning the properties. And so now it's been about about four months or so. And I'm first now just starting to get comfortable with the assets and sort of know when someone says, oh, South Park Center. It's like, okay, I know what that is now. You know, back in January, I was like, oh my God, what property is this? What's, who's, who are the tenants? What are the issues? But the more you, you do, the more you learn. And for us, it's kind of, I always equate it to like baseball cards. You know, if you were a kid, you, you could have a box of a huge box of baseball cards. I mean, maybe now kids don't right. they have Pokemon cards instead right. of baseball cards. <laughs> but you you had a you know a thousand cards, but you could go through them and you knew you knew all the players, you knew stats, you knew this and that. And to anyone else looking at it, you would say, "How the hell does this guy remember? This kid remember that?" Mm-hmm. But you, it's your thing, and you know it. And so, I think in many respects, for me. At Kimco, the properties become kind of like these baseball cards where you just, you know the tenants, you sort of know the issues, you just, you learn them, you know them, and sure. you rattle them off by site number, and, you know, it's a foreign language to anybody else because they don't know what you're talking about, but for people who work with us, you know, when we say, you know, site 105 or 116, you're like, oh, yeah, I know that's Plainview <laughs> right. on Long Island. You yeah, know, you yeah. Just know, so. I, I think, it, I mean, that the baseball card thing, I think, is super interesting right. because... Um, when I started out in the business, and, and that's a good segue because we're going to ask you how you got into the business, but um, when I started in the business at the end of 2000, um, obviously as a real estate broker on the other side of, of the of the table, essentially on the dark side, if you will. I have a story about that also. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I can't wait to hear those. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I tried to understand, I always said, how I would be able to compete with other people that were in the industry basically as long as I was alive at that point. And um, what I did was basically hit the road for like four months straight, 
hit every shopping center with an index card and draw the shopping center on the back of an index card and actually fill in the tenants, uh, do my research, find out who owned the shopping center. That's probably how I met you, by the way, is actually pulling up into a Kimco shopping center and actually writing your name down as the point of contact. Is that a possibility? It's probably the Well, it definitely I- was. Yeah. You were representing a tenant, um, and I remember the property. We don't own it anymore. It was a small building on uh, Northern Boulevard in Great Neck, and was it a do blockbuster? You, do you want to go into this now? Was it we a can? former blockbuster? Well, it, uh, I mean, yes, it was. It, it was, was. Right? before yeah. blockbuster had their problems. It was just they closed and they they moved out, and uh, I know it was probably I don't know five thousand square feet. Yeah. You know whatever. Yeah, and, I, guess, I guess we're going into this. Yeah, now. let's do it. I don't know where it's going, but I guess we're no, going. It's no really better, not that interesting. No but it's just when now. I was thinking about what we we're going to talk about, that was one of the things that that came to mind. You know, Jay, I've known since it's got to be 20 years because when I first started at Kimco, um, that was when I worked on this property. We sold it years ago and it was pretty early on that I met you. And I remember being at that asset and I'm, you know, I'm taking a call from a broker. I don't know who this guy is. He's on the phone. I'm like, I'm assuming it's some, you know, older experienced broker. I have no idea. Never met him before. Not some young hotshot. (laughs) Yeah. Young hotshot. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, I remember waiting in the space and, you know, this guy's coming. You were repping Beach Bum Tans at the time, I think. And uh, if ever you, sh- you show up in this black Jaguar, I don't know what, what kind of car it was. You would yeah, know. It was, it was like an a, XJ. You know, it was an X-Type. X-Type. Which I think was new that year. All it right. was an X-Type, which was a weird wheel drive It was a weird-looking weird car, yeah, I remember. Yeah. But I remember it was black. And you had the windows tinted, the chrome wheels. This guy shows up. Of I'm course. Like, Who is this guy? <laughs> and out comes Jay. We start, I realized he's a younger guy like me. And we started, you know, talking. And uh, that was the first time I met you. I don't think we, we never made the deal. We never made we the deal. We did not. There. You know what? But it, it's interesting. So, so... I'm glad you brought that up because I, I didn't connect that as the first time until you said it, but I now I recall it like it was yesterday. And what's so interesting about Beach Bum Tanning, and obviously one of the first clients that I was uh, representing, one of the first tenants I was representing, is that fast forward to today, the, the there's been kind of a, um, uh, a strange happenstance where I still do business with some of the people that were involved in Beach Bum Tanning then, and I think that's such a big um, part of our business is relationships, right? The right. fact that you yeah. and I are you know, still friends and doing deals together 20 years later, and uh, and and you know obviously tanning is uh, is on its way out, but uh, but I did like to tan back then yeah. in my black uh, Jaguar. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we digress. We <laughs> yeah. digress. Uh, let's let's uh, let's ask you how you started in the business. How did you get into commercial real estate? Well, you know, I I went to school. I went to Boston University, and um, I was a finance and business major at BU. Originally, I was going to be pre med. That was like my thing. I was gonna be a doctor. And you ended up in real estate? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, I quickly learned um, that chemistry and biology were not my strong suit, which I should have known. But at the time, you know, I don't know. That was sort of what I thought I was going to do. Um, but I always had the knack for for business, for entrepreneurial things. Uh, when I was younger, you know, I had all these little businesses that I'd do on my own. And so that was always in the back of my mind. When I went to BU, um, I got my real estate license and I rented apartments for a short period of time. While you were in college? While I was in college, like towards my end of my senior year. And um, that was sort of the first entry I had into real estate. You know, I sort of was interested in it. I thought maybe it was something I would want to do, exactly what I didn't know. Um, but I had gotten my license and I had done some rentals and stuff. And then um, after college, I really wanted to stay in Boston, but at the time there really wasn't opportunity there. So I, I moved back to Long Island and I'm looking for a job. And I went on a thousand interviews. You know, I interviewed for stock brokerage stuff, for insurance brokerage, for uh, all these random things that, you know, as, as probably many co- college grads do, you're sort of trying to find your first job. And certainly when you're not 100% sure what you want to do, you look at anything. You just want a job. And sure enough, I'm looking in the paper and I see an ad for um, a shopping center leasing associate. 
And I'm like, okay, I read the description. It says, you know, renting retail space and shopping centers. They were located on Long Island. Uh, company was Rosen Associates. Sure. I didn't know who they were at the time. Um, and so I sent my resume in. I'm like, well, I have a license. It wasn't in New York, but in Massachusetts. So I sort of had some idea of what I was doing. Is there and reciprocity or no? There, there is at the, but at the time I had to get a, license. a New York license, right. which I was going to get anyway. Right. So I went on the interview and sure enough, I got the job and it was at the time they owned probably 20 shopping centers all over the country. Um, so I was doing work in New Orleans. I was in North and South Carolina. They had some stuff in Florida, um, some properties in Texas. And I would go around as a junior leasing guy, basically canvas and try to find shop tenants. And for the entire portfolio or, or? For the majority of it. Okay. So they would send me for weeks at a time. Like I went to New Orleans I was there for two weeks straight. Really? You know, just. I lived in the hotel, I canvassed, I drove around, I learned the market. What a, I, what a great job yeah. at that stage of your life. It, it was, you know? it was, you know, I don't, I, looking back, I didn't take full advantage of it. You know, like I didn't, I didn't know what I had at the time. It's kind of like, okay, I'm there, I'm going to work, I'm going to do this. I got to, you know, leave it, leave it eight and, and I got to put in a full day and I got to get all these business cards. And I really, you know hit it and I didn't spend a lot of time doing other things yeah but I, I have news for you Josh that's also the reason you've achieved so much right right. you know the, the people who do take advantage in their early years <laughs> right. we see where they end up and they're, they're on probably not in the business and, uh, right. drinking those icy drinks and right <laughs> throwing right. beads yeah yard, although yard they, glasses yard although glasses. they do in New Orleans have the uh, the drive through daiquiri stands which was a, a shocker to me I think yeah. they still have them that's safe that's yeah yeah idea. but um so I did a lot of canvassing wait, 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 let's go back to yeah. that is the pickup on the the passenger side or <laughs> can the driver actually? no it is the driver how is right. that possible it's legal I don't know what the law is today but I'm pretty that's... sure back then you could only drinking have two. And drinking and driving was not illegal. You couldn't be drunk and driving. But <laughs> you, you couldn't hit somebody, but you could have some drinks. But you could have an open container. You could have open container. You, I think you could drink, but if you were over the limit, that was legal. I guess up to the limit, right. you could drink. It wasn't. <laughs> that is crazy. And so they had these drive through daiquiri stands. I don't know if they probably don't have them anymore, but I don't, I don't know. Chris, can you Google this? Yes, please. <laughs> I think we should open New Orleans drive through daiquiri stands. <laughs> right. Segway. Um, <laughs> So I did that for a while. So I learned a lot of markets. I learned the basics of the business. Um, you know, the greatest thing for me about that job was that they really gave me a tremendous amount of autonomy to just do stuff, lease space, figure it out, do whatever you got to do. It wasn't a big company. They didn't have all these procedures and whatnot. It was a family business. And they said, just just run with it and just get it done. And so I best way to learn, by the way. Yeah, trial by. Were fire. you the only leasing guy there? Um, yes, uh, one of the principals, the son of one of the principals, did like all the the more complicated deals at that point, the bigger box stuff, sure. and I was focusing on the smaller deals. But I was really the only one, and I pretty much did whatever I had to do to lease space. And it even got to the point where they had me negotiating leases which looking back was the craziest thing because I knew nothing about what I was talking about. And my strategy became to just say no, because that was the only way I could negotiate. Right. I didn't understand the issues. I didn't understand what I was talking about. So I would be on the phone with some attorney from Texas talking about a nail salon lease and I'd be going through it and I would know that they told me, you can't give this, you can't give that, you can't give this. And so I'd sit there and I'd say, no, can't, can't do it. <laughs> Why not? Because that's the policy, we don't yeah. do it. Right. And I was the toughest negotiator, not because I wanted to be tough, I didn't know enough to be able to negotiate. So I would say no and I'd get these great leases because I, they would just cave under the, they wanted to get it done and I just wasn't giving and we'd get them done. And so I learned a lot. I, I've that met way. a few people who still yeah. use the <laughs> mentality. Yeah. Actually. No, why? Because I said so. <laughs> because, yeah. Right, just because. Well, what's the reason? There is no reason I don't want to give right. it. Is there a fallback position, yes. Josh? Uh, no. No. <laughs> right. You see that today. It's true. Yeah, and, it and maybe that's some insight into why. But um, so, yeah, so I was there for a little under three years. And I got a call from a uh, headhunter, which even at the time, I didn't know what a headhunter was. I thought it was... You know, somebody from Africa or some Pick island me. somewhere, <laughs> no idea. And uh, they said, we have this position at a comp uh, Kimco Realty for a junior leasing person. And they're a REIT. 
And I said, oh, well, that sounds interesting, but you know, what's their, what's their read? I didn't, <laughs> right. I didn't know. Uh, so they told me all about it, went on the interview. Um, long story short, I got the job, I did leasing there, and it was kind of the same thing. It was just, you know, I had a lot more mentoring there as a younger person, um, but it was still a lot of just figure it out and get it done, and that was always what I was very good at. Um, even as a younger kid, I was just always good at figuring stuff out and just solving problems and things. And so, was your just? I'm, I'm thinking back to this time frame, and uh, my experience was that there were, you know, the majority of the people for the company I started in the business for, again, were were substantially older than than me, who is a recent college college grad. And I seem, you know, it seems to me that that back then especially in the suburbs, right, outside of Manhattan, it was not a younger person's business, right? There, was that the case at Kimco, or was it, would you say uh, there were a lot more younger people I would say your age? My age, no. I mean, I think at the time, what you're saying is accurate, is there really weren't a lot of younger people in the business. Um, they all felt older. But looking back, they really weren't that old. You know, like the right. two people that I reported to were about 10 years older than me, right. and they seemed much older. I was, you know, probably 24, and they were 34. Right. Right? They seemed like they were really old, sure. but now I'm 44. That 34 doesn't seem so old anymore. Right, but I'm asking because I feel like, like, would you say that there are more younger people graduating college and going to work for Kimco today? than there were at that time, at least in the New York office, let's say? Yes, but not because, I don't know if it's because there's more demand or more interest or right. just because we're a larger company and so we're hiring more people. Right. My, my gut is that the interest level in our industry kind of ebbs and flows. And when we started in the, in the late 90s and the 2000s, it was sort of at a lull because you know, we were sort of in a recession and real estate wasn't really this fancy, sexy business at the time. And, you know, it was sort of a boring business, I think. Yeah, and but I, I, you I, had the internet boom. Totally. I think you worked for an internet company, I think, yeah, right? Early I did. On, or... Right. So, but that's why I, I guess, you know, I almost feel like when you were going through the paper and you saw that, that job posting for a lease shopping center leasing associate, mm -hmm. you were like, what the hell is that? Right. Like for me, when I was, looking to get into the real estate field and I kind of dis discovered the retail, you know, segment of the real estate field, it it was like, wow, like people actually own shopping centers. Like, right. you know, like <laughs> as a kid going to like the grocery store with your mom, you're like thinking that, you know, you don't even think. Right. Just, but just there. It's there. Right. Right. I had never thought about that either. Right. And I think that was one of the things that attracted me to the to the business and the industry was that I was working on property and doing things that at its conclusion other people would see. So if I did a nail salon, yeah. you know, and then it's a, at a property near where I lived, then I could say to people, hey, see that deal? I did that. Or I'm working on that on that supermarket lease or sure. this or that. And it, it sort of becomes this thing of pride where and kind of like accomplishment where you could say I did this and now there's something to show for it there's a physical store there that people are going into that wasn't there nine months ago you know what's interesting totally. though because that's what really attracted me to the business because I, originally I wanted to be in the music industry and then Napster happened and that whole world fell apart. My father was always in, in construction. So it was like, it was always cool to, he would drive past like a homes he was involved building. And I was like, oh, yeah, I built that development. I built that development. And, and I was interning in the city. And I'm like looking at all these buildings around. And I was like, it would be cool if I could leave my mark on a building somehow. And then I started with office space leasing, but that's neither here nor there. But I was like, how could I do something? It's harder that... to see an office tenant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Josh also became a local celebrity with all his signs with his name on it. Right. Too, right. So in the retail world, it's even more yeah. interesting because you actually have signs and you could put whatever you want on them for the most part. Right. Right. So. And no one, when I started at Kimco, no one really did that. They just had a generic number. Right. And for me, I was always like, well, you know, I want my name on there because I want people to know what I'm doing and that I'm working on this and that sure. they know who I am. And I always thought that that was important. And for years, I had my name on I remember. so many signs. Yeah. And the greatest thing is people would come up to me and be like, wow, you own, you own all those properties? <laughs> 
and I would pause for a minute. And I'd want to. I'd want to say yes. But I said no, no. I don't own them. I work for I, a company. I wish. I right. Wish. I wish. You know. Um, One day. Right. But it always it always amazed me how the average person outside of our industry just didn't really understand that. You know, even like I was before I got into it. You don't really understand how it works, and totally. so you kind of get into this into this industry, which ends up being somewhat like this small club of people that sort of know about what you do. And it's a very small, you know, a group of people that are relatively small compared to other it's, businesses yeah, and I industries. Think compared to other businesses, it's very small. I yeah. mean, you know, it's a very niche business and um, it, it's, it, it keeps kind of getting smaller. But back to what I was saying, you know, I, I, I think there's a little bit more awareness today about retail real estate. At least that's my impression. But I'm also older and been in the business for going on is 20 years. Is that a function of you just being in the business I, though? Maybe. No, I think there really is more awareness. And kind of what I was saying before was that I think going back to younger people in our industry, it ebbs and flows. And I think it that goes, it coincides with how the industry is doing and how it's perceived. So right. in, the, in the late 90s when you know, it was the internet boom and everybody wanted to be in tech businesses or this or that. Real estate seemed boring. But since, but in 2000, up till 2007, real estate was on fire. It was, REITs became very popular. The stocks were, were moving very quickly. The business became much more professional than it had been in years past. It became much more institutional it, it just it it grew very quickly and during that time all of a sudden all these young people out of college are like oh i want to be in real estate i want to you know i want to work for a kimco or a um you know a cbre or sure. whatever it was and the interest level skyrocketed absolutely until the recession absolutely and then everyone went away again right. and so when you look at the people in our industry i think you can kind of Maybe it's like rings on a tree, right? When you cut a tree, you can kind of see what happened over time. If you look at the people in our industry and you see how many people there are of certain age groups, you can kind of tell where and when they came into the industry. You know, so ten, Definitely. so now ten years ago, or maybe fifteen years ago, in the heat of the run up in the last market, you had a lot of people. So I don't know what age those people would be now, but I, my bet is there's a lot of them in our business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that. Um you know, it's funny because again, as a broker, you know, our business is so competitive and we're all in, in some way, you know, vying for the attention of the same tenants, uh, and obviously the same landlords. Right. So, um, if you're really good at, at what we do, you don't mind the downturns because it kind of resets the clock a little bit. And in, especially in our industry, in the good times, you have a lot of less qualified, less professional brokers um, that either transition from residential or from other businesses and are able to make deals and, and more or less survive, even though they're not necessarily very good at what they do. And those types of brokers, quite honestly, have always given the rest of us a little bit of a bad name. Um, so, you know, in the good times, yes, it's fun to ride the wave, but, uh, for, for other people who have been kind of through the downturns, uh, and able to s sustain, you know, it's interesting when, when it is, you know, the market turns a little bit and I'll be honest, sometimes I actually root for it. So, yeah, but I think it's not only brokers. I mean, I think the market's really good. It, everyone's a landlord, everyone's a developer, and then everyone has a great idea to be a tenant or open up a store or do something along those lines. And then the market's great. Everyone's cruising and making a lot of money and then right the the, yeah. the, the faucet turns off and it's like right. oh shit and so 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 josh we are in april of 2018 and uh it's the 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 retail industry has changed drastically i think uh, anybody listening would agree that uh, don't say apocalypse. No, no. I, won't, I won't say apocalypse <laughs> and i won't say omni channel right. I'll, I'll avoid those two <laughs> two terms but um, omnipresent is the new one. Oh, is Amazon it? is omnipresent. Right, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but my question for you is, um, I'm sure everybody here would like to know, where do you see the market going? And I'll ask it in a two-part question. Where do you see the market going? And, uh, and, and what's your take on w what new types of tenants we're going to see 
occupying space since there is an abundance of space coming to the market. So let's start with where you kind of see our uh, the market going. Well, where we being the industry and, and retailers and landlords and, and you know everyone related to our business, I think right now is in a, a period of transition and a period of figuring out what the future is going to look like. There's been a lot of, you know, I'll use the word disruption um, going on, um, mainly caused by a lot of, you know, internet based companies and, and retailers that failed to evolve over time. Um, you know, some people just want to blame the internet. I don't prescribe to that theory. I don't think that's the issue. I think the bigger issue is we have a lot of stale retail in our in our business. Um, retailers who were used to the old way of doing business and you know what worked for the last maybe 50 years no longer works today and it's changing very quickly. And all of that is causing a lot of angst in our business. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's clearly some bankruptcies that are happening, which affects you know a lot of other things that we do. And uh, I see it that we're in this state of evolution and, and change. And what the business looks like today may not be what it looks like 10 years from now, maybe even five years from now. Um, and I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what it's going to look like and what does it mean for shopping center owners? What does it mean for retailers? You know, how do they effectively operate in this new environment, which is like Russell said, it's what you say, omni omnipresent, omni, omnipresent. Yeah, Amazon is omnipresent. They're right. involved in everything that you do. And I think there's right. some truth to that. And I think that's where it's going. And there are a whole slew of retailers who are trying to figure that out. And, and how do they quickly evolve and, and change and um, realize how people live and shop and, and, you know, just get by day to day today? You know, how do they integrate themselves into people's lives? And then you have these this other contingent of retail that I think part of part of them feel like they maybe don't know what to do. They're not really sure how to how to how to pivot, how to move, how to change their business. Um, some are probably in denial, and some are honestly they may have the desire to do it, but they don't have the cash. They're levered up with debt, and they just as much as they'd love to invest in the business and change what they do, they just don't have the capital to do it. So they're sure. stuck sure. and. That's the good example is really Toys R Us. They're, they were probably a little bit of both. You know, I think they clearly were levered up with debt and didn't have the capital to change, but they also, I think, didn't really want to change. I mean, they say they were trying all these new things, but that really wasn't going to change anything or do anything different. I mean, well, and I think to your point when you said how every people, there's a whole you know constituency of people that are blaming the internet. Toys R Us could have. And the, and the internet's been around for a long time, right? right. Toys R Us could have figured out a way to utilize the internet even 10 years ago in a better way than they were. Yeah, they just, they... They said, we don't need to, we're not going to, we don't right. care. And, and any retailer that's in dire straits, the internet's been a big part of everybody's life for 20 years. Yeah, a I mean, long not, as now. not as much as it is today. Not but, as much as the last 10 years. Correct, but, but okay, but 10 years is a long amount of time yeah. to figure out the kinks and to, and to adapt, and they just say, no, it's it's like, oh, it's going to go away, but obviously it's right. it's not. And, and it's changing very fast, and the one thing that I think about, I've said this a few times to other people, because I found it very interesting, is that, you know, ten uh, iPhone 10, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You probably have an iPhone 10. I have one, yeah. The, the reason it's 10, because it's 10 years old. Right. So 10 years doesn't seem like a long time, but in 10 years, look at where that, how quickly that changed. Right, all how the, the devices apps changed, and, and how people are buying and shopping, and that really, um, if you think now 10 years forward, it's gonna be drastically different than sure. it is now. And so we're in the middle of that change. Right, and all the interaction could be on an Apple Watch, or who knows? there's no more phone and it's holograms, who, who knows? Right. Or just, it the, knows the, you read the your mind. The least amount of friction as possible. Right. Hold on, one, one fun fact, so. In New Orleans, there's still daiquiri drive-throughs, but you cannot drink in the car. 
So I guess you have to like take that like Starbucks foam thing and put your daiquiris <laughs> in it and like take it home. Is that accurate? Yeah, they serve, okay. they give you a straw and it has a lid on it, and you could just punch it through if you want, but like they don't do it. There's then a it's straw. illegal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't. You cannot puncture yeah. the. The the surface slopes. with the straw. So buy it and bring it home and <laughs> yes, drink it. There you go. <laughs> um, so I, a little more, I agree, obviously, with everything you guys are saying. Um, Josh, I completely agree that uh, that it's really more the tired, old companies that don't differentiate <clears throat> themselves, you know, and, and do not have something unique and special that are, that are dying. Um, also, obviously, companies that don't embrace technology properly or quick enough. Um, but I guess the, my question is, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on um, with the space, not just not just shopping center space, Manhattan, right? I, I spent the weekend in the city and I was amazed at the amount of signs and windows and, and vacancy. And I actually spent last night with one of my buddies who's uh, who owns a bunch of buildings in the city. And I'm negotiating several deals on behalf of uh, tenants in, in, in the city. And, and, you know, we're able to get things that were never, uh, never even, you couldn't even ask for the things that we're actually getting today. Um, my question is, with that amount of space coming on the market and kind of flooding the market, what types of tenants are going to actually fill that space? Because, you know, my initial answer would be, yes, fitness and service and medical. And, you know, we know the urgent cares are slowing down. The fitness concepts are not going to backfill all this space. So wh where, wh what are we going to start to see that we haven't seen yet? You said clearly it's going to change in the next five, ten years. Do you have any opinion on what types of, you know, uses that we haven't seen yet might come about? I don't know. I mean, I can't envision, although I'm sure there will be, these brand new uses that we never thought of. It probably will happen. I can't imagine what they could be. I mean, axe throwing? It could be. Well, I don't right. know. Entertainment. That's, right, right. Right. And so, so there will be some <laughs> amount of, of new uses and categories that we haven't thought of. But I, I think it's going to be more of just more efficient retail. I think the retailers and the categories that you have are gonna remain. I think they may become a little smaller. Um, they'll certainly become a lot more efficient in how they operate. They won't need as much warehouse space. Um, but then the flip side to that is maybe they do, right? Maybe they're, they're omnipresent and they're doing all these things and now all these stores become distribution hubs and they wanna stock product there. And so I, I really don't know. I think in terms of uses though, I mean, what we're seeing is we're continuing to see just a tremendous amount of restaurant space, uh, you know, fast, fast casual concepts, franchise concepts, a ton of that. Um, we're working on a large redevelopment project in Staten Island called the Boulevard, and it's, uh, we could talk about that later, but it's a multi-level project with, with some big box retail on the second floor. And, you know, I think people are surprising. It's big box, but it's in a tight market with a lot of density, which I think allows you to still do that. What types of tenants? It's the basic shopping center uses that we're all used to. I mean, it's an it's anchored by a ShopRite grocery store, but almost uh, just shy of 80,000 square feet. Um, on the second level is all big box. We have Marshalls, Ulta, PetSmart, LA Fitness, um, Alamo Draft House Cinema, Party City, uh, AC Moore, Models, um, uh, this other uh, retailer out of Canada called um, Drawing a Blank. It's the new version of Mandy that they're uh, rebranding from Canada. Yeah, I've heard of it, but I can't. It I draw a blank me. what it was yeah. called. Um, <clears throat> but so all the big Chris? No. <laughs> <laughs> Research time. on the Google. Um, all the big box on the on the second floor, and then the first floor we have, you know, I think almost a little over sixty thousand square feet of retail that initially was envisioned to be a lot of boutique shops and apparel and and whatnot, but those guys aren't there. They're just not interested in doing deals. But we have a tremendous amount of interest from restaurants. It's all restaurant. I mean, we have every category that you can think of, and I've never seen anything like that, but that's where the demand is. Yeah, I mean, we, we represent a lot of restaurants, and um, but we're seeing that, and we just actually yeah. got off a call with 
the the CEO and founder of a of a, a large chain that's that's uh, you know has a great great brand, great concept, and they're starting to see their sales overall decline because of all of the competition, right? right. The, the seats in the market, basically, and um, a lot of our restaurant clients are seeing that because you know there's. Too many only, options. There's only so much pie, and we're right, all chasing right. the same pie. Is exactly what he said. And, exactly. And and for those particular spaces, he's not only are sales declining, but rents for those spaces are going up, and the competition for the better spaces is getting more and more challenging. That is becoming harder and harder to be profitable in that space. Yeah, we're fighting in in you know suburban markets outside of of Manhattan, and not the boroughs. Right. We're we're, we're seeing. Uh, if there's a new strip of 10,000 feet that's built and it's like A plus as far as locations go, you know, where rents should probably be, let's call it, you know, high 40s, $50, it, landlords are asking, you know, 75 70. and and they're getting it. But, you know, at what cost? I right. mean, how, how can uh, how can tenants really, really thrive right. when they're paying $20 more in rent than they really I mean, should? It means to be a, a fast, casual restaurant in 3,000 feet. You have to be doing 1,000 a foot. You got to do $3 million in sales right. year one to be profitable. And that is not easy to do. I mean, yes, you can get there. But to come out of the gate doing those kind of numbers is not an easy task, working, especially with the competition. Right. You're also working really hard to right. pay rent. Right. You know, you know, how much money, how, what's, what, what, kind, what are you netting uh, on, a, on a restaurant so, with that So why do you think there's, quality? why do you think from the brokerage side, why do you think there's so much demand in all these restaurant chains wanting to desperately expand as quickly as they are? There's several reasons. I mean, you know, this this company in particular <clears throat> raised a lot of money in a short period of time, so you have to kind of deploy that, right? So, so uh, Wall Street, Wall Street. Well, I yeah, think this just, is private just, equity. Yeah, private equity. Private, right. I think yeah. private equity in general has really driven the growth because completely. They, it was a hot sector. They all said, "Let's invest in it." Right. Then these guys raised ridiculous amount of money, 50, $100 million, and you, once you raise the money, what do you gotta do? You gotta spend it, Correct. right? And then you gotta make a return on the money, and it's like, there's, you can't sit back and wait. Yeah, there's that, right? And 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 obviously, whoever's investing in these concepts are looking to scale and, and scale pretty quickly to, to, to um, obviously get a return on their investment and then either flip out of it, you know, and, and uh, that we know that game, but I think specifically the, the 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 project I'm thinking about is on Long Island, and um, you know we all know uh, that it's very difficult to develop on Long Island, so you don't have new space typically coming on the market. So I think there is in the better on the better corridors, there's a pent up demand because it's not easy to get there. Right. So you I, can, I agree with yeah, that. Yeah. So I think. But again, I think in Long Island, it might be more justifiable to ask for those higher rents, but these companies are looking at their portfolio from a national perspective. So those numbers that might not be seventy dollars a foot in Missouri. Right. But they're fifty when they should be thirty and it's and this but the sales are less and it's just the, the better markets and the better stores can't prop up the whole portfolio. Yeah, I mean we see it all the time, right? Where where whoa, whoa. Where, uh, what are you doing? You know, doing business in the New York Metro uh, market has always been um, been fun, right? Because most concepts do really well, right? So it, for the most part, and a lot of concepts have higher volume locations. It doesn't mean that they're more profitable, but for the most part, they, you know, like Panera Bread has some of their top in the chain, right? Like just using as an example, Home Depot, other other uh, concepts have their, you know, top volume units uh, in, in the New York metro area. Not surprising, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot more national consulting work today. And it's interesting because when you go to the better projects in middle America, the rents are still high, right? It's not, they're not like $22 well, a foot. The construction costs aren't much different. Really? That's, I mean, that's fine. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you got to got to make a return on that capital it all comes back to the rent right you know yeah so, i mean the taxes aren't as high right, right. so and from a in rent in general no but in yeah. general yeah, i mean yeah. nassau county when you have twenty dollars in <laughs> extra charges that's rent elsewhere in the country but um you know it, it it's always on the flip side challenged us because we'll tour with many concepts who are considering you know coming to long island or north jersey and I mean, a lot of times we'll get feedback that, you know what, we just decided to do like two locations in this market for the price of one, so to speak. Right. We see that a lot, too, with, yeah. with a lot of different retailers. You know, one of the things that 
that we have as a challenge today with with some of the you know vacancy that we get back from toys and whatnot is there's a lot of interest out there but sometimes you lose interest not to a competitor down the street but you lose interest to another market and there are a lot of times where retailers will say you know we can either do you know this one site in new jersey and this is the return on that deal or like you said we can maybe do two deals in this market right you know break into a new market that we're not in and get a better return on on our investment right and so you're you're up against those things too which you know is so challenging with that in mind what is kimco as a company doing to really pivot and capitalize and be able to bring in tenants to those type of projects and also capitalize on fast casual and the limited availability of big box retailers. So as a company, you guys are you know the biggest and the baddest. What are you guys doing? That is a perfect segue. <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> Clearly you are. Um, yeah, so we, we've seen a lot of this happening. We've seen a lot of this coming. And what we've done is we've been working on repositioning our portfolio. And we, you know, for the past year or so, we've been selling uh, a lot of real estate. We're selling out of markets that um, we think won't have the growth going forward, um, either the population growth or the rent growth or the sales growth or ultimately for the shopping centers, NOI growth. And we're selling out, out of a lot of those assets and we're reinvesting that capital in, in denser core markets. So we're focused on New York, Boston, DC, you know, South Florida, um, you know, Philly market, you know, West Coast, parts of Texas. And that's where we see the future, kind of like the, the Sun Belt area in the Northeast of, uh, of the US. And that's where we really want to focus our attention and, and place our capital for the future. So we've been selling out of a lot of these assets. That's one of the things that I've been doing in this Midwest market is we're really winding it down. We're getting out of Missouri, we're getting out of Kentucky, we're getting out of uh, Michigan. You know, we're selling a lot of those assets and that capital is really going to two places. One is to reinvest in, in, in new assets, better assets in the core markets, but we're also spending a lot of it on redeveloping other sites that we have, um, one of which is that project in Staten Island that I mentioned. It's a $186 million project, and we're selling a bunch of shopping centers to reinvest that capital into that asset um, to provide further growth and opportunity for the company. So, Was it a profitable center previously, or? No, I mean, it, it was underutilized real estate is really what it was. Uh, we had a property, that one in particular, was anchored by um, a Kmart and a Pathmark, and Toys R Us and uh, who's who of right. retailers that um, got stuck in the Stone Age and we were able to get it back and we knocked the whole thing down and we're building this new type of retail for, for the market, maybe not new in general, but for the market. It's multi-level, it's big box, it's a lot of restaurants, it has a movie theater, it has a gym, it has the grocery store, it has all the components that you would want for a successful asset and we're able to take the NOI from, you know, a mid single, you know, $5 million and triple or quadruple it with the amount of rent that we're getting from this project. So that provides NOI growth for our company. So we have projects like Staten Island going on in DC. We have a large project called Pentagon, which is, uh, it's, it's mixed use, it's residential, uh, two towers of residential over retail. Uh, we have projects in Florida, we have a large um, lifestyle center that um, is in the works now in Fort Lauderdale and Dania, not far yeah. from the airport. Um, we have own a mile of real estate along I-95, which is, you know, great real estate. And we'll do some, you know, mixed use there. We have condos and hotel and, and retail. And so that's in the, in the works. And so a lot of this capital, we're kind of just repositioning everything. We're taking the, the capital out of the markets that we just don't think are going to be long-term growth opportunity for us as a, as a publicly traded company. And we're putting it into better markets and, and reinvesting in our properties. And as part of the reinvestment, I think it kind of dovetails with everything that's going on in the industry today where, you know, retailers are falling out and you're having bankruptcies and this and that. And, you know, people say, well, what are you doing with those assets? You're losing Toys R Us, you're doing this or that. What are you going to do with them? Well, we're going to redevelop a lot of them. We're going to reposition them. We're going to modernize them. We're going to put in tenants that are going to survive for the future. Many will, will add residential components too. I mean, we have a whole pipeline of deals and sites that 
we've identified the opportunity to do mixed use residential. Some are short term, we'll be able to execute those in the next few years. Others probably a little longer term, but we have a plan and we have a path to get there to reposition those assets. And those are the things that we're trying to do as a company to kind of address all these things that are going on in the market with you know, the omnipresent retailers and, and everything else that's happening. And we just think that that's kind of the right position for us to be in. Smart, makes yeah. a lot of sense. I didn't hear um, adding office components. Is that <clears throat> is that you're not seeing the demand for that? Or I mean, obviously, multi. No, not, not really. Yeah. I mean, the demand is what that we're seeing is is primarily from multifamily residential. You know, as the population ages, and um, you sort of have these two dynamics working together. I think that's pushing demand for multifamily, certainly in more of the suburban markets is that on one side you have the baby boom generation that are getting older they're they don't they want to downsize they don't want to live in their houses they want to live in a smaller more manageable um place where they don't have to maintain anything in a walkable setting right, right. so you have that on one side and then on the other side you have the millennials who they don't want to live in houses either they want to live in multifamily, walkable restaurants all this so you have sure. these two things converging converging on each other and in the middle, you have the shopping center asset. And with what's going on in the market today, it's giving us the ability to meet that demand, right? If this shopping center industry was, was on fire, we probably wouldn't be focusing so much on residential. We'd be doing Best Buy deals and sure. Target deals and yeah, everything else. Um, but because of what's going on, it's given us the opportunity to kind of take a look at some of those assets and say, well, if it's not gonna be all retail, you know, if we have a Toys R Us box and maybe the next guy isn't so great and maybe it won't be 100% retail anymore, what else could it be? It might be residential sure. and not every site, but there's a fair amount of them that we have that we think at some point in the future, there'll be demand for it. Sure. You know, and that with, with all, everything going on with the technology <clears throat> of, of Uber and the driverless cars, and maybe you don't need as much parking as as you will, you know, maybe ten years from now than you than you need today. I, who knows if that's going to really happen that quickly? But if it does, all these things start to come together, and the shopping center ends up being like this really good asset that you can mold and do something else else with if it's in a good market. Right. And so that's why we're we're trying to focus on that. Makes sense. And and just back to the office thing. Um, are you hearing in, in suburban markets of any shared spaces, WeWorks, things of that nature? Are you seeing that demand at all or, or not necessarily? We haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Um, although I'm kind of surprised because I think that, you know, going back to what we said a few minutes ago about what are like a new use yeah, you could see, that's what I I'm asking, could yeah. see a 20,000 square foot suburban we work type concept in a shopping center totally you know yeah. well especially if you're saying and I, I think what you said about the baby boomers and the millennials kind of converging and they're all looking to not live in homes and i think that i'm like on the edge of the millennial generation and like we have this conversation about moving to a house or moving to an apartment or staying where we live in the city and, and maintenance sucks yeah and and having to <laughs> like you i know the second i move into a house the boiler's going to explode that's just my luck um but Josh built his own swing set. So. <laughs> yeah. But if you're saying that this, if you, and I don't disagree that the future of redevelopment of shopping centers is going to be adding this residential component and then you're going to have millennials coming in and even a baby boomer having a co-working space within that setting makes a lot of sense because it creates a place for people to go to collaborate, to do work, whether it's working on a Etsy project making pins, I don't know, or actually working and developing a, an app. I mean, it's like a great asset to the overall right. yeah. I, I, mix. I, I actually, uh, in my travels, <clears throat> I stumbled upon a, a really interesting uh, shared, you know, it was almost, actually, it was like a WeWork meets Soho house. So it was like more than just shared office. It was pretty cool. Like it turned into um, almost like Paramount, you know, if you've ever been to the Founders Room. It looked like that slash a WeWork. It was really cool in a shopping like a center. Speak, a speakeasy WeWork? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> do they so have drive through daiquiris? They do not. Not the one I went to. <laughs> um, but it was interesting because then there were different levels of membership. So you could be a member who 
offices out of there right. for whatever level you do, or you could just be a social member and go there and you know have beers and drink coffee or whatever it is. And uh, I thought it was really interesting, and I think that there will be some more of that because you know owning a company and having the overhead of an office actually several office locations it's not necessary for a lot of companies so i think it'll i just think also just being in a we work and i remember we had that meeting it was the first time i yeah, actually culture, was yeah. in a we work it's cool i mean yeah. it's like very well built out very thoughtful and like it's a little distracting though a little but so is being in any office i mean it just but i think yeah but like you know some weirdo that you don't know like you know walking in on you is like if right now if we were in a we work it would be tough for would us would you have a handlebar mustache Clearly. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> All right, we're going to transition. Um, I, I There was one other question I had that was retail real estate specific, um, and I guess I'll ask it, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll transition into some more fun questions. Um, that question is, you know, we hear a lot about, so you would agree that retail is not dead. No. Right. So, um, so there... W- there's so many different types of articles, obviously, that come from completely different angles. And a lot of the ones I read talk about, you know, retail's not dead because you have so many internet companies that are now looking for brick and mortar locations like Warby Parker, right. Bonobos, blah, 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 blah. Um, where are those tenants going and how much does that impact our life? We haven't seen them really focus intently on the shopping center space at this point. You know, they're really not suburban yet. I right. think they're mainly focused on, you know, the urban type locations, sure. you know, Main Street, High Street, whatever. And, I, you know, the question is, will they expand out to the suburbs? I think they will at some point, but you're not going to see them, you know, you're not going to see a Warby Parker or... or you know, and untuck it in every every shopping center. Right. Might, for example, on Long Island, maybe you have one or two. Yeah, probably. Sure. Um, Are they in malls? You know, like I don't think so. I mean, maybe the A malls. Right. You know, the A malls will still survive, but yeah. the B malls, I don't think so. I think a lot of those retailers probably would rather be in an A shopping center than a B mall. Sure. Um, a malls will always dominate, I believe. But you know, the B malls, they don't need to be there. So I think you'll see a lot more of that. I think a lot of the online retailers have started to figure out that they need the brick and mortar component for a lot of different reasons. And that's why you're seeing a lot of these guys open stores. But for the most part, they don't have a lot yet. I mean, some may only have 20 locations around the country or 10. Sure. You know, so do they continue to just double that and maybe get to 100 at some point? Still doesn't really change our life. No, it doesn't. And I think it's interesting is that I just did a Warby Parker experience. Like I bought glasses at Warby, and yeah. it was a, it was an, the first time I went. It was a few years ago it was when they first opened brick and mortar. It wasn't the best experience. I just bought a pair of sunglasses, and it was an amazing experience. It was the choices are narrowed down. It's very curated. The help was e- like very. They were very helpful. The glasses were one hundred and seventy five dollars compared to six hundred dollars right. like they normally are, or whatever it is. And they came in in ten days, not even nine days. They got to my house, delivered to my front door, and I think that. I'd much rather do that than go to a regular eyeglass place ever. And I mean, you wear glasses, I wear glasses. It's like, it was such a nice experience that I could see them just being in, in a lot more markets in suburbia, just from, from actually retailing there. I, I definitely agree with that. The, the question is though, are, you know, is a guy, is a, a tenant like Warby Parker going to have as many stores as a pay less shoes? No, no way. No way. You know, so you know, how far would you drive to go to uh, Warby Parker or some guide shop to get fitted for whatever it is sure. that you want? Further than a normal retailer, but right. if it was more convenient, maybe I'd buy five pairs of glasses right. in the year because well, it's just like, oh, I, I, Warby's here, I'm gonna hop in, see what they have, and for, for regular glasses, are $99 for 99 bucks. I'll buy a few pairs, it's just. Right, like I wear glasses also, as you said, and you know, I I haven't bought on Warby Parker, I've ordered from online and I've gotten the samples and I got five in the box and I tried them on and I didn't like them. I sent them back and then I was kind of done. I was like, "Ah, I don't want to order again and try another five. If there was a location that was within, I'd say for me, a half an hour, I would have gone there to buy them. But, um, 
but I'm I'm not. The only one is in Manhattan, and that's just not right. actually, worth went, it to me to I go. I went to the one in Manhattan. I was actually there. I just saw it, and it's in Rock Center. I was like, oh, let me go check it out, and I ended up buying glasses. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a lot of runway for those guys, but they're yeah. not going to fill all the – and they're small, too. I mean, right. the stores are yeah, small. But they're, not. It's funny. So we're, we're obviously – on a podcast right now and I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm in the middle of how I built this which is one of my favorite podcasts Do yeah you to no that? I haven't heard that one you'll literally like you'll love this because it's basically the founders of so many different types oh of really oh that's concepts. cool yeah so Warby Parker I'm in the middle of and your horrible experience Russell you need to listen to this podcast so you can understand their growing pains and sure. you'll know exactly why but they have it down today but they uh, it's a great story um, and they've clearly disrupted the the, the glasses business in it. Well, it's just like I, I I could be in the city and there could be a taxi right in front of me and I will call an Uber. It just it just it, it is what it, it's just I don't remember we had that it's heard that, we heard that guy Bart talk remember years yeah, yeah, yeah. ago and it's that whole idea of pulling your wallet out and making the transaction. Totally. It feels free if you just it just goes on your right. phone. I don't that's even think about it. True. Right. Friction. It, right. it is it is really all about the experience and the convenience. And Absolutely. that's what the retailers are I think now trying to figure out. Avoiding friction, right? I coming yes. from somebody who still doesn't use a Starbucks app and goes yeah, to Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. It's a little weird. Uh, get reward points, bro. Right? Transition <laughs> into um, into questions that are not business related per se. Uh, best advice you've ever been given, Josh? The best advice I'd ever been given. Um, I, you know, it, it's really not, I thought about this a lot yesterday when I was thinking about what we we're going to talk about. And I don't know if this was really advice that I was given or kind of just figured it out. But I think what it is, or maybe what I would tell somebody else is that, it takes a really long time to get good at something. And I think looking back, you know, on, you know, the career I've had thus far is, is and this preparing for this yesterday kind of made me reflect a little bit about, you know, kind of my career and how I got to where I was and what was going on. And, you know, what would I tell somebody, you know, who was starting out now? And the one thing that I really thought about was that it just takes a really long time. And to do anything really well, you have to have patience. And you don't always realize how far you've come until you stop and, and look back. And you're like, wow, look at that. You know, in the, in the moment, you don't know it. You feel like you're just doing the same thing over and over again. But every day, you're getting a little bit better, a little bit smarter, you know, a little bit quicker, a little bit whatever. And it's only when you stop and look back after maybe many years that you realize, wow, all that hard work, you know, paid off and, and you get to a better place. And, you know, there there's that saying, um, I forgot exactly how it goes, but something like this overnight success was, you know, 30 years in the making or right. whatever it is. You know, you don't know all the work that went into and all the sweat and, and everything else that people slaved over to create a success, whether it's a successful company, a, su a successful career, um, or just a huge knowledge base of information, it takes a long time. So I, I think the best piece of advice that that I wish someone had given me or mm -hmm. that I will give to somebody else is that it takes a lot of time and you can't expect you know results overnight. It takes a lot of time. You got to be patient. You got to put the hard work in, and it happens. It it one hundred percent will happen if you put the work in. It will one hundred percent happen. It's just going to take time, and you have to be patient. And I think, you know, a lot of maybe younger people today really they they want instant gratification. They want to be you know the top of their game right away. They want to be the, the head of the company. They want to do this. They want to do that. And just for the most part, not all people, but, you know, for the most part, that's not how it goes. It's it's just a lot of hard work and a lot of time. And, and there's no substitute for that. Absolutely. Well said. I, I, I preach that all the time. It's actually on my Insta story from this morning. Yeah. Um, and uh, It's a marathon, not a sprint. 
especially this business right. too, right? I mean, we're, this this business is uh, is is definitely a long game. You know, you're not you cannot get into the commercial real estate business expecting to get far quickly. You know, I mean, I did when I started, and I quickly realized that that was you might get lucky here and there. Yeah, but, but that's luck. Luck. Yeah. Lucky on a deal or two is not long term success. No, no, you know, sure and you got to make a lot of mistakes. You know, you only learn from making mistakes. You know, I can't tell you how many mistakes I made. Yep. Hopefully no one's listening. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you make mistakes and you figure it out and you, you learn from that and you, you know how to do the next deal, deal better and smarter and faster. And, um, or you could just say no. Or you could say, <laughs> right. But you know Josh what? has come a long way. He I, says maybe. Yeah, right. maybe. Say, hey, I'll, I'll think you, about it. I learned a lot from that experience, yeah. right? You know, you, at the time, you don't yeah. know what you're doing and, and you take a, a position. But I'll tell you now, I'm a, a much better negotiator. I understand the issues. I understand what people's hot buttons are or are not going to be. And that only comes from time and experience. Practice. And practice and making a mistake here and there. Now, does that negotiation skill come into play with your children? Has that no. helped you in? Uh, you just in, say in, no to that. No. no. Yeah, <laughs> just, I just yeah, no. go back to the no. <laughs> well said. Why? Just well because. Because yeah, <laughs> I said exactly. so. Go to your uh, room. <laughs> uh, so what are you? What are you? I'll let you take a sip of water. And, and uh, what would you say that you are great at that that listeners who know you would not necessarily know? Well, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm great at anything. I, you know, to be honest, I'm not very modest. Josh. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think I'm great at anything, but I feel like I'm good at a lot of different things. Um, I, I have a lot of a varied interest in different types of things. You know, I like the business. That's clearly interesting to me. I like real estate. It's why I do what I do. Um, but I like other things too. I'm a very creative person. I like making things. I like doing things with my hands. Like you said before, I, I built a swing set from scratch for my kids. I got 3,000 pounds of wood dropped on my driveway and <laughs> I amazing. measured, cut, drilled, and you know, put together a, a pretty elaborate play gym for my kids that now they never use. Is it used. safe though? Like, is <laughs> it is structurally ro- it sound? It is rock solid. Re- did you concrete posts and everything? It or will not move. Yeah. Did an it architect come move, in? So. Yeah. No, no architect. Well, kudos to you for yeah. that. Yeah. That's, that's so I'm, you know, I, I, I'm in, I get into a lot of different things, um, you know, and when I get into them, I, I, I kind of, I don't want to say I get obsessed with them, but I focus on them intently. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I started getting into running. I was never really a runner, but I started running. All of a sudden, I'm on YouTube. I'm watching videos. I'm getting the magazines. I'm like learning all about running, you know, and then I get into other things. You know, sure. I got into swimming. I was doing that. And I got into you know, photography about a year ago, you know, not a great photographer, but I'm interested in it. And I watch a lot of stuff on YouTube and YouTube is the greatest thing, by the way, sure. it is the, the greatest invention ever. You can learn anything you want on there. You can just spend, I can spend hours and hours. I barely watch TV anymore. No, I same. only I, watch I, YouTube. I, I, YouTube or Netflix, but yeah. I, I hope you're watching Real Saber. But. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, Plug. I, I agree. I, it's like, I, I'm the same way. Like I find something I'm interested in, and then my wife's like, you become obsessed. Not to like uh, to a detriment, but it's like, I want to learn everything about it, and I want to get really good at it. And with the... Like I was always, I was thinking back, like if you wanted to go learn something in the past before the internet, you had to go like read an encyclopedia, right? Or like get a or, book. Or take a class or right. go to school. Now it's like anything I could think of, it's like, oh, how did they do that? You just Google it and then go on YouTube and it's like, oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah crazy. it's crazy. It's, it really is. And it's, it's, it's just another example of how quickly things are moving today. You know, people learn very quick. It's, you have endless access, unlimited access to information. And uh, you got to learn to use it to your advantage. So back to your question, what you know, what am I great at? Really nothing, but I have a lot of varied interests, and I let them lead me wherever it goes. Fair enough. I uh, we gave you a couple choices on these questions here, and I'm going to actually ask one that you didn't choose. Yes, just because I'm curious how that was the rule. <laughs> That's that you I'm break breaking rules, rules here once again. <laughs> You have to go on a road trip from New York to California. You could bring three people that are not family members. Who do you bring and why? Could they be alive or dead? They can. Okay. Oh, God. Who would I? 
I thought about this one a lot yesterday. I really right, well, had you a, had a head start. I well, I didn't come up with anything. Like, who would I want to sit I, yeah. in a car with? All right, let's make it a shorter trip. Let's shorter. make it a shorter trip, <laughs> not to California. Let's make it from New York to Massachusetts. Four hours. All right. All right. Well. Is that easier? <laughs> it's a little easier. I guess it's a shorter trip. I can make a mistake. Um, well, one guy that I'm interested in from YouTube, and I'm sure you guys know this guy, Casey Neistat. Yeah. Like, Great oh, answer. Yeah. Great I watch answer. all. Shout out, Casey. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I think I really like what he does. I like his whole energy and everything. And he's an interesting guy to me. And I like the, the energy that, that he delivers in whatever he does. So, like, I've watched him for a while and I. I think he's an interesting guy. He would be super interesting to be in a car with. So I, I yeah. think that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, after that, I don't really know. Fair Just enough. Just you, Casey. Fair enough. <laughs> Casey, uh, who's obviously watching, must be flattered. Yes. Or listening. But or there listening. is video. Actually, yeah, I, actually, I do have a, a second. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry, Casey. Sorry. <laughs> the second one would, would be Milton Cooper, um, the founder of Kimco, who is a really a, a dynamic individual who, you know, endless wealth of knowledge and um just also just a very interesting guy he's an avid reader he's you know super smart um someone that i think any of us could learn a tremendous amount from uh, certainly for our business and our industry and just to get perspective on really the life cycle of retail i mean here's a guy who you know did deals back in the day with zare and caldor and woolworth and any other number of retailers that don't exist today and and someone who can who has really long-term perspective on what it is to be in this business and that maybe it's not always about just the retailer but it's really about the real estate and if you have good real estate the retailers can come and go but the real estate stays good and you know that's something that that you know I've learned from him, and I'm sure he's got a tremendous amount of knowledge. And to see him and Casey Neistat in the same car would probably be cool. very interesting. <laughs> that would be very interesting. You know, what's, what's, what is what's something that's interesting to me is I went, I, I haven't had much interaction with Milton, but I went and saw him speak at Hofstra. It's got to be 10 years ago at this point, maybe more. I'm, I'll say 10 years. And he was, the entire time, was preaching that, that medical was the new retail. And he was preaching it. And this was way before the influx of medical in the retail space. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> and he was right. And yeah, it's, listen, it's, it's, it's incredible. It, it's no secret that he is probably one of the best real estate minds, uh, clearly, that we've ever, um, I think, had the pleasure of spending time with you more than obviously the two of us. But uh, another great answer. I mean, Milton has changed the landscape of the entire country uh so great answer do you want to give us a third or you want to move on to the last question gonna, of the I'm, podcast I'm gonna, i think i'm gonna bow at it to two all right two all right russell why don't you go ahead with the last question of the day okay your choice well i'll no ask pressure. one that i'll ask one that josh actually wanted to answer okay. all right if you were hosting this podcast what is one question you would want to ask other people in the commercial real estate field did I say I was going to answer that? You <laughs> did, but we could, I mean, we could do a different one. That's no, I'd fine. like to hear that. That's fine. So what was the question? What was the question that so if you were ask? So if you were hosting this podcast, what question would you ask a real estate broker, another landlord, or a retail tenant? What do you want to know? I think I'd want to know how, how they see our business. I'd like to get as much perspective on what's going on as possible. I think you know, working at Kimco and, and having access to a lot of assets, you know, tells us a lot. But I'd really like to know from other parts of our industry, what what do they see and, and how do they feel about it? I'd love to to hear from retailers directly. What's impacting your business? Like you said about restaurants, like I before I thought that was fascinating that, you know, there's there's only so much of a pie to go around and the rents are high, which we know. And you know, how are they going to survive? Um, what are the challenges that we hear from, you know, other landlords, smaller landlords? What are they seeing? What are what are brokers seeing out there? Is it different than what we see? Um, you know, maybe even going down to the vendor, you know, 
area. I mean, one I was talking to one of our vendors not long ago, one of our landscape guys, and he was explaining to me how his business has become so difficult because of the change in the immigration laws that he can't hire people. Wow. He, they're they're not here. He you know people had left in the winter to go back to their home countries and they're afraid to come back. And so now he's left with half a staff and he's trying to figure out how does he maintain and and you know service these properties with either half a staff or maybe half an old staff and half of a new staff that doesn't know what to do and that's a challenge that that they're having and how does that impact our business does that mean our rates are going to go up does that mean uh, the service is going to decrease and and tenants are going to be unhappy you know is there something we can do to better position ourselves to anticipate a problem there in the way we operate our business so I think I would just like to learn a lot from others in our business that do something different than what I do. What are they seeing? And to try to pull it all together and, and see if that helps give us any clearer insight into either what we're doing now or what we should do in the future. Um, just to tack on to that. Well, first first and foremost, you've been a wonderful first guest for the real state of re, of re, the, the real you've state been a of wonderful, retail. <laughs> you've been a wonderful first guest on the real state of retail podcast. It's it's been fun and I appreciate being here. Yes, and uh, you know that you have an invitation to join us anytime you're available. Um, you are an honorary third host moving forward <laughs> uh, whenever you'd like to join us. Um, Part two of Russell's question, who would you like us to get on this podcast? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, who, who do you think would be interesting for us to do this with? Besides Casey Neistat. No, <laughs> in our industry. Yeah, obviously. I agree. You kidding. know, I, I mean, I would love to hear from somebody at Whole Foods and how they're integrating Amazon and what they're seeing. And that's a great, that great I think thought. would be very interesting. Um, along similar lines, somebody from Walmart. You know, they're competing against Amazon. They're both trying to get to the same end goal, but, you know, clearly coming at it from two different sides. Like, what are they doing? What are they seeing? I think that would be interesting. Um, Definitely. I don't know. I mean, those those two those would, are prob- great. would I mean, probably be great ones. Two we should, thoughts I have. Yeah, let's make that happen in uh, in Vegas during ICSE, where we'll, we will be podcasting For sure. live from our suite. Uh, well, thank you, man. Super appreciative, and uh, this was a lot thank of fun. Thank you for having yeah, me. This was, this was great. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> that was good.